Hello, Gareth. Can you hear me? Hey. <laughs> All right. So I just shared that with the two presenters. So they should be joining us in just a minute. And then we'll get them started. Um, let me post on the social media. But um, if you can be here, just kind of to greet those folks and share co hosting with them, I'll be right back. Okay. And would you like me to make you a host? Um, hey. Oh, there. Hey, Matthew, how you doing? Good, how are you? Sorry. Yeah, I, so so Abby on. is one of our wonderful visitors. She set this up. So Abby, you can Hi, make thanks. Matthew and um, we're going to have one other person joining us in just a minute. Yeah, she'll be on in just a minute. So Awesome. Perfect. And I just shared the password through social media. So hopefully people will be checking that and awesome. joining us. Cool. All right. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> good. Good. Yeah, I'm actually uh, kicking it in my daughter's room right now. Nice. So, uh, my life these days. <laughs> it's a crazy world right now. It's, it's a crazy you. world. Yeah. There's Nanisha. She's coming on. Awesome. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm pretty good. It's nice to put a face with the name. Yeah, we know a lot about you. <laughs> All right. It's super dark in here. So, um, Matthew, I made you the host, um, okay. and so I think only one person can be a host at a time. Okay. Um, so when you're done, um, or like once you pass it off, if you go down and press participant, mm -hmm. then you go over to Nanisha's name, and then you and you just make her the host, and then so she, and then okay, she can I see the I see the, okay the screen sharing oh. and stuff like that. Perfect. Okay, that's what I'll do. Good. Okay, I'll just say okay. I don't know what's going on, but okay. <laughs> you can't hear us. Can you hear us? I mean, I can hear you, but I came in like midway in the conversation. Okay. So, um, so I'm the host I'm, right now, and then um, um, when you go to, to show your poster, or we're we're gonna kind of tag team the slides, so we're we'll, we'll never get our way through that. But then when you want to show your poster, I'll make you the host, so you can share your screen. Yeah. Um, right now, like we said we'll um, tag team the thing, and then right, if right. I, you want to give input and I want to give input, we'll just Perfect. do it that way. Sounds good. <laughs> My cat's joining us. <laughs> I thought I heard a cat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not in egregious pain or anything. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's the funniest thing about these Zoom things. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a student. I just sent them the password, okay. and I've just posted the password, so we should have a few more people joining us here soon. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> and I'll have to check the said for the password because originally when I made the meeting, um, I put like I don't want to have a password, and then. <laughs> It made one anyway. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> totally cool. Awesome. So Alexis just joined us. She's a student. All right. Let me just double check my email here, see if we get any more that are coming through. Um, but uh, I was going to say, uh, Matthew and, and Nancia, we um, are going to record this as well so that we can post it 
to uh, our expo page so that people who are creating uh, posters for the, the, they can still take advantage of this in case they missed it today. So I know we got one student and we might get a few more that join along the way, but uh, feel free to start whenever you would like. And, and uh, Matthew or let's see, yeah, you're the controller now, so you should be able yeah. to record it. Okay. Um, so whenever you are ready, just make sure to do that. And then at the end of it, I'll get that recording from you so that we can post Perfect. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and I think, uh, I'm recording on my computer as well. So okay, good. Okay. I've okay. Good. already started when it. Okay. So you, so do I need to record or no? Are we, are we good? If she's recording, we should be good. Okay. All right. Let me try and share my screen. Um, Sorry, I've never shared a screen before. So no, this is good. We're all learning. <laughs> you just do the, scare, the share screen, the button at the bottom, the green arrow. Yeah, I clicked that, but I'm still. It's asking for like. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Let me see if it'll do that. Oh Jesus! I got to go back and uh, look at my privacy settings. Is acting. No worries. <laughs> Sorry, it's telling me I gotta. <clears throat> okay, now let's try it. Yes. Can we see it? Oh, yep. Okay, perfect. Let me open up the, I had it open, but that kind of threw me off. Okay. Uh, so, hi Alexis, um, and those of you who will be watching later. Um, so, I'm, uh, I guess I'll introduce myself, and then Nanisha, you can introduce yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, my name is Matthew Madison, and I'm a postdoc um, in the Merit Program, and I work in the School of Medicine. Um, I'm a pulmonary immunologist, so I study um, how cigarette smoking affects um, lung function. Um, I also study how e-cigarettes affect um, lung function and inflammation. Um, and so that's a little bit of blurb about myself, but Nisha, you can take it away. Okay. Hi, guys. It's nice to see you or meet you or give this seminar to you. Um, so I'm also a postdoc. I am a merit fellow here at UAB, and I kind of am a conglomerate of a lot of things. I'm traditionally a microbiologist, but I do um, immunology and microbiology to look at host pathogen um, interactions. And specifically, I do that in um, streptococcus disease. And so we want to understand how dissemination works and how the bacteria actually enforces that. So um, today we'll be talking to you guys about how to make a poster. And just wanted to make sure you guys keep in mind, this is a brief guide, okay? Um, we're just covering the basics of making a poster. Um, there are other things that you can do to make your poster more jazzy or more complicated or basic, but that's up to you. We're just giving you the the kind of bare bones. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm a big proponent of posters. Anytime I go to a conference, um, I often, instead of doing a talk, I often go for a poster because it's, you never know who you're going to meet when you have a poster session. You have people coming by, um, all the time during these poster sessions and it's a good opportunity for you to network um, and it, there's really a lot more dialogue that goes on around a poster as opposed to the talks at the conferences and things and so it's just a good opportunity for, for you to meet people uh, future colleagues future career opportunities and so mm -hmm. it's having a solid poster is, is important um, and it really can um, open up some unique op opportunities for you so yeah and I think throughout the um when we well when I was looking over the the um the slides you know I'm very much an introverted person and so how you <laughs> how you present um posters for an extrovert versus an introvert we'll kind of talk about those things too throughout the um throughout the guide so um some key points to always consider when you're creating the poster is to be mindful of your audience um, are you going to a meeting that is um, for microbiology only? So or are you going to a more broad meeting? There's going to have people from a variety of disciplines. 
Um, in that case, you might have to adjust your poster um, to, to give a little more detail about techniques that are unfamiliar to people who aren't in your discipline. But it's always just important to consider that when you're, when you're creating your poster. Um, and again, it's, it's a, you're going to tell a story and it's, uh, that you, I mean, you can use your post, you're going to use your poster to guide that, but really what you're doing is giving them a spill, um, just a, a short spill about, um, what, what your work involves. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be too complicated. I encourage using a lot of graphics and we'll talk about that later. It helps um, mm -hmm. as, as you're telling your story. Um, and then it's a good rule of thumb to always have two versions, a really short version for, um, people who don't seem to be interested, just give them a one to two minute speech about what your poster is about, what your findings are about, what your conclusions are, and then have a more detailed version for people who are actually interested in the topic. Because what you'll find is some people will come across your poster and they'll be, and this is particularly for conferences, they'll be uh, not as interested in your work, that, especially in those multidiscipline um, conferences. Then you'll have somebody who's really wanting to, to find about, out about what you're doing. They do something similar and so you'll have a long, need a longer spill for that type of person who want to know more about the details of the poster and the details. And of the so, oh, I was going to say, and so what I wanted to add at this point was that when you have two versions of your story, depending on your audience, I found that people actually like, at least when I do it, I always say, you know, let me know if you have any questions before I even tell the story right? Because number one, this allows you to kind of feel for your audience, right. whether they're super interested or if they're not. And then it kind of gives them, I guess, time to wrap their head around what you do and what they kind of want to take out of it, right? And so um, they'll, they'll give you more targeted questions. And I think a lot of people, especially, well, even at bigger meetings or smaller meetings, they really appreciate that because they can kind of read on their own or they can deduce certain things based off of what they know about your work and about their work that they can kind of guide you to. All right. And then a, a last key point is, is to practice kind of your spiel before you go and stand in front of your poster, just to have kind of, you know, it doesn't have to be scripted, but it, it just have a, be comfortable with what you're talking about, go through it in your head a few times. Um, it just makes it more, I'm the type of person that I like to, to go through things before I get up there and present anything. So I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. It makes me more less stressed and more comfortable. Um, and, it, and then you avoid using those filler words. But if you do that, if you practice a little bit, it doesn't have to be perfectly practiced, but at least know what kind of how the story is going to flow and how you'll talk about it when you do it. Um, so next slide, you want to take this Oh, one? Gareth raised his hand. <laughs> oh, I did. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure if that's the, the proper way to do this. I'm interrupting you as other people might do when you're trying to present. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say um, the second version, the detailed version would be really good for this spring virtual expo where it's, it, we're asking people to have them 10 minutes or less. So, um, but you still want to practice your recording. That's really good because you're going to have probably do two or three different versions as you record your presentation. Uh, this is going to be good for all sorts of different presentations, but I just want to emphasize for this specific spring one, we will have that virtual component. Um, but it is good to think about the different types of audiences you'll have there as well, because you'll have all sorts of different people looking at your presentation. So good. thanks for letting me interrupt. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Cause I'm, no. I'm glad that you brought that up because, because I don't know in particular, these, these students are preparing for that expo. And so, so for that, we'll be looking at that more of the 10 minute version, but that's good. Thanks for chiming in. Cause I, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what that entailed um, as far as the length of that one. So that was good. Yeah, that was great. So the first, one of the first components um, of making a poster is a title, right? So the title shouldn't be too long, right? It shouldn't say the never ending story that never ends always and forever will always end. Like it should, <laughs> I can't even finish that sentence, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't take, it shouldn't be too long, right? You don't want your, to lose your readers because, or the people at your posters engaging them because they're still reading your title, right? And then there's different types of titles that you can have. So we have one um, type of title that is basically where you're making a conclusion, right? So you're telling the reader or the person that's coming to your poster, this is the end result, right? So for me, uh, one of the titles that you'll probably see on my poster will be um, Influenza A 
influences increased susceptibility of streptococcus pneumonia. It's telling you specifically this is what's happening. This is the end result. Um, the second type is eye-catching or intriguing titles. So that could be something like, I don't know, Star Trek The Next Generation, looking at strep pneumo, I don't know, in the lung or something like that. Um, and then you also have puns. So puns, I would err on the side of caution. Um, you are at a formal event. You have to really consider um, the audience there because some people won't understand. Um, some people won't think it's funny. So yeah, if you do do it, um, just err on the side of caution for those. Oh, there, and these are the examples. So um, the example of like intriguing is a Home Alone. So we all have seen that movie. Elimination of all but one alternative sigma factor in Listeria monosynthogenes, okay? Um, poor forming toxin, the whole story. So poor forming toxins, basically they poke a hole in, uh, in cells. So that's where you get the whole thing. Um, that's the pun. And then um, you have a conclusion kind of title. So necropsosis inhibition prevents cardiac and pulmonary damage during pneumococcal disease. Yeah, I often, most of my presentations or posters have been this conclusion sort of title. I'm not super creative, but people, a lot of people are more creative than I am. But so if you can have an eye-catching or an intriguing one, that would, um, just yeah, like Nanisha said, the puns just Consider the event, and if, is it is it relevant? Do you do you want to? Um, because some people, sense of humors are different, so uh, mm -hmm. I always just do a conclusion type title. But <clears throat> uh, as far as the layout, um, and we'll have some images of it um, later, and you'll get to see some examples of them. Um, but typically, the layout is um, you'll have a title title for an abstract, where a section of where you'll have a brief introduction and the conclusions. Then you'll state within that abstract portion under that title, you'll have um, your hypotheses and your central questions that you're trying to address, your objectives that you're wanting to address. Then you'll have a section of relevant background. Um, sometimes these go, the abstract and relevant background go hand in hand. So depending on how you're doing your poster, but um, uh, background information, what did the reader, what did the audience, what does the audience need to know coming into the, to the research that you're doing? All the, um, you can use images. I encourage images. Um, graphics, um, mm -hmm. from some slides that you've done in a seminar or things like that, you can incorporate that in there. It helps to tell the story a little bit better. Um, and then methods, um, a section for methods, really the, the primary methods that you're using, you don't have to go into detail about PCR or methods that everybody uses, but if you have a unique method that you're doing and it's a particular exposure method um, that not many other people do, it's important to include that on how you did what you're doing in your, um, your studies. And then in your results, um, you don't want to include every piece of data that you have. You want to include the major takeaways from your research. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be in the same exact order. Uh, it's just how it, will it flow better with the story? So you can kind of structure it like that. And I always like trying to do that when I'm making a poster. I'm like, how will it fit and make the story more, co more coherent um, mm -hmm. and how it make it flow, flow, flow well. Mm -hmm. um, so with each of the results though, I usually have like a fit, I usually do it with like a figure with a legend. So you can talk a little bit about um, the, stu the, the study and then if you did statistical analyses, kind of just a little blur about statistics in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally you'll have conclusions. What did you come away for this? Um, and then what are some of the unanswered questions that you you've haven't yet, that you wanna explore in future directions? So you'll have a future direction section as well. Acknowledge people that have helped you in the project um, and funding sources. Mm -hmm. And then uh, again, um, this really relates to the more of the background information, the citations that you used when you described your background or uh, some of the abstract portions. So that's typically how um, the major sections of a poster and you can organize it in different ways, but usually it kind of flows like that. Um, and we'll yeah, see some and examples. Yeah. And for the method section, it also helps that if you have a main method that you keep referring to over and over again, right or a main um, experimental design that you keep referring back to, you kind of want to put that in the methods section. You don't want to have to keep saying, okay, you know, I infected these mice for 300 days. You know, things that are generally um, universal to your story, 
you can put in the methods. So it can save you a little time and explanation when you do the results. Right. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about structure here. Okay, so um, it's kind of weird because I have to orient myself. So on my right, since you're looking at the computer, it will be the same. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so on the right, uh, you kind of have different types of structures that um, we typically see in scientific um, posters. And so typically um, what the structure is, is that first is the identification. And so the identification is normally at the top. You normally have this big block of color and it has um, the title, the author's affiliation and the institution, or it could be um, organization you're with um, as the logo. And the logo really can go anywhere on the, um, on the poster. It's not designated to the left-hand corner. A lot of people do do that, but you know, honestly, it's like where you have space, you can put it. Okay, and then the next is the orientation or the guide. And so um, some people don't use numbers. So, and what you see here in the, in, the, in the pictograms is that you see that it's flowing. So it's going from one down to two, then going to the, moving to the right to three, down to four, going, et cetera. And then you see the same kind of thing with the, the nine panel one. And then you see something slightly different with the other two panels. And so the main thing about the orientation and the guide is that it's continuous and it's, it's flowing the same direction. You don't want to go from one to three, then go to four, then go to six. You don't want like a zigzag pattern. It needs to be uniformed in how you are progressing through the poster. Um, and so this is really important because we just talked about the structure of like how you, what are the components of a poster and it needs to follow it. So, you know, you have your title, you have your authors and affiliation, then you'll have, um, typically you'll have your um, abstract in the first part and then you'll go into the introduction. Then you'll go into material and methods. Um, sometimes it can be an illustration um, like we talked about before, like a timeline or experimental design. Then you have your results, which are figures and figure legends, kind of describing them briefly, what the figures are actually showing you. Then you'll have uh, another portion that has this discussion and conclusion. So basically, what are we trying to take away from this, this presentation or this poster? And then, of course, the references and funding. But this is extremely important um, when you're making a poster. It just needs to be uniformed and you need to always go with the flow. If you, if you figure out one way that you're gonna organize it, you have to keep it that way. You can't switch up. And typically um, when you're making a poster, you're gonna do it from left to right because in America, we read from left to right, right? So it should just be natural when you're when you're making the posters and these particular um components of their poster mm -hmm. so how do we actually make our poster so there's these are the more logistical um pieces of the um making it in powerpoint things like that um so we're going to go over those details quickly um <clears throat> uh so that when you do make your poster it's going to be on one powerpoint slide um and so you'll you'll basically go in and you'll set up your, um, and we'll talk about that, the, the, the margins and everything in just a minute, but it'll, everything will be on one PowerPoint slide. And what you'll do is you'll submit that for, for, for printing later. But in, in the case of the expo, um, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, but with, with a poster, you, you just, you put all of your information, the title, all, everything, methods, it's all gonna go onto one PowerPoint uh, slide. Um, and that, the, it, depending on how what the size requirements are for your poster presentation that you're going to you can you'll have to adjust that and um, we'll show you how to exact how exactly how to do that in just a minute um but uh so you'll you'll put it all on the one slide and then when you finish once you finish putting everything on there you want to leave a little bit of leadway on each border 
So you want about a one inch margin all around your poster because with printing, sometimes it, it can be cut off if you, if you don't leave your, give yourself a little lead way. So with the entire poster, you at least want a little, like at least one inch all the way around of white space. Um, just to correct for any things that might happen during printing and then cutting it. And you don't want any of your text or your data cut off from the, the poster. So. <clears throat> okay, so Matt just talked about slide dimensions. So slide dimensions are really important. They should, um, when you're doing a traditional poster, it should be provided by the conference, um, the dimensions that your poster should be. And so um, normally, well, the posters that I normally do are 36 by 48. Mm -hmm. um, it gives me enough room to do certain things, but um, just depending on what you have to present in terms of the amount of data that you have to present, it can be smaller or larger. And once again, that's gonna be defined by your conference. Mm -hmm. And also remember that um, there are two different ways. So you can have the regular paper, like we read, up and down that it could be that way I forgot how you say that or it could be landscape so vertical or horizontal that's mm -hmm. the way that you can make your slides right. um, so what we did for this particular presentation is based on PowerPoint 2007 and 2010 which I think most people have so when you go into it you'll select the design tab and then you'll click page setup and so um, I can show Oh, that would be great. That's awesome. <laughs> Let me see if I can. I was like, I wish I could do this, but I can't. <laughs> so this is, I think this is 2011. I don't know what this is, but this is the newer version of, of. So what you will do is you'll go to the, the, the menu bar here and click design. There's actually two ways to do it. Um, and then I can't see because everybody's hit there. This so is also a there. Mac that, um, that Matt is using. So yeah, if you have so a PC, different for... it's different. So then I click design and then I click slide size and then I go down to page setup. And here is where you add your dimensions. And you have to do it in inches. So um, if you're doing the three foot by four foot poster, you'll do 36 by 48. I um, mean, once you adjust that, you hit okay. And that's the size of that slide. And that will be, when they print it out, that's what it will be. So that's how you set it up that way. So. Perfect. But then you can also you can also go up to file and go to page setup as well, and it does the same thing. So there's two two options of doing that. Yeah. And depending on your width and height, that will determine if it's horizontal or vertical. So whichever side, because um, they they don't do that option um, in the newer Mac models of PowerPoint. It just it's kind of smart enough for you. It's like, oh, you don't have to tell me which orientation that you want. If you just put in the dimensions, we'll figure it out for you and we'll do it for you. So it's very um, important that you know if you want to do a 36 by 48 or 48 by 36. OK, um, because those are two different um, horizontal or vertical ways that you can do do the poster. Let's see. So there are some, so UAB offers templates for this. So you can bypass all of all of that and just do a template that has all of UAB, UAB's logo and everything on it. And then you just add all the information um, to the poster itself. And I've attached the link up. There was uh, this is an updated link of of to get all those templates. And there's like five or six different options. This is just one of them here. Um, and you can add your information and everything in that that way. And I, I think it's a, they're all about like a 36 by 48 uh, format. So um, if you would rather do that, it helps with you not having to choose your color palette or anything like that. You, it's already made for you and you can just put your data in and your, all your text and everything. So it makes it a little bit easier by doing that. If you don't want this poster template, there are other poster templates online. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so oftentimes if I'm like, oh man, I presented this same type of poster, like 50, 11 times. Okay, it's time for me to do a different one. I'll go and type into Google Black Scientific Poster Templates, and then I'll just see what other people have done to see like, oh, yeah, that color scheme is like pretty, or like, oh, right. yeah, like that background is pretty cool, or I like the contrast between the things. So you're not limited to the UAB template. There are other ways you can do it, but I will caution you to say that, um, a lot of times schools, especially in the PR department, you know, you have a certain logo that your school's department 
like basically trademark or copyright. So when you want to put your logo on your posters, you do want to go through the right channels to get the logo if you design a new poster. All right. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the design um, tips that we have is to consider poster flow. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Your poster should read from the top left to the bottom right. So once again, we're in America. We read from top to bottom, left to right, okay? Um, the color and selection is really, really important. Um, it's good to maintain a good contrast between the background color and the text color. Um, so you really want to consider using a light background color and a dark text color. So if you want to be super, super conventional, black and white. Okay, so you have a white background, um, you have black text. Okay, also that's very um, much cheaper, more cheaper um, in terms of printing. Um, it, but you can go whatever, whatever you want. You can be as creative, especially since this is going to be a virtual poster session. So hey. <laughs> You can do what you want, okay? Um, but typically when you're printing a traditional poster, you typically do um, a white background, maybe a tan background. If you're feeling froggy, maybe a, like a nude or a mauve kind of um, background color. Um, don't ever, ever do gradient background colors. That's terrible. Don't do like the rainbow background colors don't just don't do that um and also with the color se selection you also want to be cognizant of people who may be colorblind so you don't want to use the yellows you don't want to i mean you can use yellows for like figures and things like that um but you don't want to use yellow or red or green like a lot um if you think you know somebody in your audience may be colorblind um so of note, the colors that you see on your computer monitor will not actually reproduce exactly the same on the printed copy. So you have to also be considerate of that. And um, and those are really the colors like, the colors that we don't, that are not the red, green, blue, magenta colors. Outside of those colors, your colors may change. Um, so graphics, you want to make sure that they're at the proper resolution and you want to limit your image resolution to about 150 DPI to ensure that it's able to print properly. Um, <clears throat> if they're copied, say if you get an image from a, a web page um, and copy it over, a lot of times those won't be in really good resolution, so they won't look good when the poster's printed. Um, so there's something to keep in mind. You just want to make sure that they, I mean, look, <laughs> are uh, actually conveying what you want them to convey and not so pixelated you can't see what's going on. Um, they should be pictures and typically uh, the picture, unless there's some kind of transparency or transparent background, you want them to be in a JPEG format when you copy and paste them over um, to the PowerPoint slide. Um, it just helps when, when printing um, later on. Um, if you have graphs or charts in, from Excel um, to include in your poster, you can actually copy and paste those directly from because they're both Microsoft products, so you can copy and paste over and they'll, they'll be just fine. Um, but yeah, just maintain, you wanna make sure that the quality of the image, um, I've had early in my graduate work, I, I remember having some issues with that where I copied and pasted over an image, but it was a, a poor quality. It was from a, it was from a GraphPad Prism, but it, the, the way the, the, the copied and pasted, I didn't, it, it, it was very pixelated. And so when I printed the poster and got to the actual conference, it just, you could tell it didn't look as nearly as clear as all the other images did on my poster. So it was definitely a resolution issue. You want to just be very cognizant of that when you're um, transferring them over to your poster itself. And if you see that, like, if you go to a website and you're looking through a paper and you're, and you're saying, oh, I need... I need that particular image and it's pixelated. One trick you can do is make it into a PDF and then copy and paste it from there. And then in regards to pixelation, sometimes, not always, sometimes you can see when your pictures are pixelated when you're in PowerPoint. Um, it'll look, it'll, it may look like to you, like my eyes are looking bad, you know, <laughs> my I need some glasses or something. That's typically a sign that your 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 photo is 
pixelated. Right. And if you zoom in far enough, you can mm-hmm. start to see where the distortion is. Mm-hmm. And so if you if you see it on PowerPoint, you definitely will see it. It's going to be magnified on your poster that's right. like three by four feet. So um, when you see those things, you get a hint or an inkling like, oh, that looks weird. Fix it. <laughs> because mm-hmm. you don't want to have to print your poster again um, just due to the lack of not or the lack of um, not having a good poster, I mean, sorry, picture due to pixelation. Mm-hmm. So this one is um, actually, I think Nanisha and I both agree on this. You wanna make use of graphics when you're telling your story. Um, it's mm-hmm. definitely important because a lot of times we have these lengthy, especially in the methods section, we have these lengthy explanations on how we, uh, we did our methods. Um, and when you're telling the story to, someone in the audience a lot of times they see the text and you're just just reading that out loud it doesn't really they lose their they lose focus pretty quickly and they don't pay attention to what's going on so here i have just a a text um format of of what some of the methods that i use with with our cigarette exposure protocol um when it's in the text form it's just a lot of a lot of a lot of to take in but if if we kind of use a more of a graphic representation of it alongside that it helps to really tell the story it helps to convey your point on how you're actually doing your experiments um so if you can i often encourage you to have you know definitely have your methods in there in in a text format but shorten those if you can and use more of a graphic to show whether you're doing arrows to show we did this this and this or whether you're showing how to do an exposure protocol like this where it just helps you communicate better to the audience and it helps them engage a little bit better when there's not so much text that they're taking in. It's more of a, a graphic representation of it. Right. I think Matt definitely hit the head, nail on the head here. We both agree that um, pictures are, are a lot better than block words. Yeah. And so what you notice from his previous methods is that it's very, very specific, right? So he talks about the strain of mice he used. He says they're two months old. Um, He's saying that he got this time-controlled two-way valve system from Humphrey, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Those are the things that you can shorten down when you're trying to describe, you know, you're doing the figure legend for your for your methods. Mm-hmm. And remember, this is a this is a this is a conversation between you and the person that you're presenting to. If they have questions, they'll stop you and they'll say, hey, where did you get this chamber? Or, you know, what specific brand of cigarettes did you use? Or, you know, what type of mice are you using? So you can be, it's okay for you to generalize, you know, a model like this because they'll ask you specific questions if they need it. Okay, so we're going to talk about text now. And so um, typically when you do text, you want texts that are clearly, that are, people are clearly able to read both near and far, okay? And so typically that's sans serif fonts, um, and that's definitely for your title, subtitle, and, and headers. And so those particular fonts, um, they're really good because you can see from far away. Um, and so the most common of those fonts are Times New Roman and Arial. I know y'all are probably like, that's so boring. That's what I use to type my papers. But in this case, it's really important um, that people can read what you're saying because, you know, you may be talking through your story and they didn't catch something because they're reading. And so in that case, they need to be able to, to read what you wrote. And so you typically don't use font sizes less than 18 because remember, even though in PowerPoint you are, you know, you see this little small text, you have to remember your poster is 36 by 48. That's huge, right? And so 18 point font is going to be so tiny, almost microscopic. And so you need to use a larger font size when you are um, having it presented on your poster. So this is really important key point. You need to be consistent. I think that's one of the biggest things that we can probably uh, emphasize to you all. It needs to be consistent, like everything needs to be consistent. And so all the headers should be the same size and you should always use the same font size throughout all of the poster. Um, And so if you use a different file, so if you, let's say you're in, um, if you're using a Mac versus like a Word document versus something that's not office compatible, make sure you text in the same um, 
the same text box and PowerPoint because sometimes they don't have the same fonts. And so you just need to make sure. And if you use Times New Roman and Arial, like everywhere a package or every office package has that. So you won't have to really worry about that. And this is just some guidelines. We're not gonna go too much into it, but these are kind of the font sizes that you wanna use. Uh, definitely for titles, you wanna use a large font for that. You wanna be min at minimum a 72 point font. And then for your subtitles, um, 48 to 80, um, and then section headers are, are a little bit smaller. And, but your, te your, your smallest text should be no less than 24 point size, size font size, point font size, <laughs> sorry. Um, so that's just some general guidelines uh, when you're making your poster. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so this is a crucial, crucial step. <laughs> I think I made this mistake when I was an undergrad. I did not save it to PDF. I went to print it and stuff shifted. And let's just say my PI was not happy that he had to pay for like two posters, okay? So um, it's important to save your poster to PDF because it basically freezes what you see on PowerPoint to be printed on your poster. And so for UAB, UAB is no different from any other university. So in the case that you have to print a poster for like a summer um, internship that you're on, generally this is the same thing that you have to do. You make it in PowerPoint, but you still need to save it as a PDF file. Um, the file should be set custom um, to your page size for proper printing. And so like they say here, it's 36 to 48 inches. Um, typically when you just hit file save as a PDF, it already automatically does it for you. Um, so you should be patient during this time because um, image files are larger at posters when you're doing these larger posters. And so it takes time, but it's not generally that long. You don't have to wait that long. Mm -hmm. I would say that as far as printing is concerned, when you do send, send in your poster for printing earlier than later, don't do it the last minute because sometimes things happen and say you're having to leave on your flight and you said you just you're just grabbing your poster you have that you don't have time to do anything and you open up your poster and there's something wrong with it you don't have time to reprint it that's happened before with me where I've had to like go back and like try to print out stuff on an actual computer paper and put it on a it's I've had some some crazy issues in the past but just make sure once you, you have plenty of time to um from submitting to getting the poster, make sure everything looks okay in case you do have to get it reprinted. Because that occasionally that does have to happen. If there's a lot of people printing posters, sometimes the printer malfunctions and it'll like leave off a figure. And mm -hmm. so sometimes that's easy to fix. Like in my case, it was easy to fix. There was just a blank white spot. So I printed out <laughs> the figure onto a computer paper and I just taped it. It looked tacky, but it was just for a minor conference that I don't really care about. But uh, if you give yourself a little lead way and, and don't wait till the last minute, you can spot those early on and get it reprinted and not have to worry about it. I think Matthew brings up a really good point too. Um, so this is also a checkpoint. Maybe when we do this again, we should put checkpoints. So like where people can um, like right. pause and make sure. So when you're saving your PDF, this is a checkpoint to see if your poster is pixelated. So if you just print it like a regular paper, you'll also see if stuff is blurry on your paper mm -hmm. before and catch it before you send it off to the printers. And so um, Matthew was saying, too, that, you know, he didn't want to print another poster and the importance of doing it early. The, also, the importance of doing it early is that it's cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. Not okay. only you can catch mistakes, but it's cheaper and you don't have to do a rush order in case you see something wrong or that you want to change. Mm -hmm. True. So we have some examples for you guys. Um, I would say that this is an example of a not the best poster um and and Nanisha, you can chime in and comment on what you do like or what you don't like about the poster mm -hmm. um i would say it's very text heavy there's there are really no graphics i mean there's some there's a picture of a hamster is that a hamster there um on a scale but there's not a lot of graphics to help your audience kind of understand what you're talking about um there's a few things wrong. the title is, is not I, I'm not crazy about how the title is presented, <laughs> the way it's it's formatted. 
Caroline, um, I get it. It's a pun though. Pig <laughs> based off of. Oh no, no, I get that. The, t- the title itself is fine. The way the text is, is kind of just. I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm picky. It makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, it, there's just you definitely want to include some graphics in your poster because when you're having your audience, you're trying to explain what your, your research is about and they just see a lot of text. It's just hard to follow and you're not going to be as engaged and you're not going to get your point across and you can miss an opportunity for, you know, you know, a potential colleague or something like that. Or, you know, a lot of these poster conferences and these graduate school type things, I mean, they have money prizes. So, you know, that's that you, everybody wants some cash. So, I mean, you, if you, there's money involved, you definitely want to have lead with your best foot forward. So mm-hmm. um, we have some other examples of some better posters. Nynesha has hers, and we also have one of Ashley's. That's a little more clear, um, and it's designed kind of following that format that we've described. Um, so we have our abstract or background um, described here. Um, the hypotheses are clearly stated. Um, we have results. Um, where there is the picnic, you have the data and then the figures with the statistical analyses, things like that. So these are just a reference for, for everyone to look at and um, kind of if you want to structure your poster in this way. It reads in the direction where you start here, your top starting in the top left, the story goes starting here down to your bottom right, which is kind of what we were ta- talking about. Um, you kind of want to lead your readers in that direction of how the story goes. And then you end with so- Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, man. No, no, I'm finished now, yeah. <clears throat> so I do want to talk about Ashley's. Uh, so <laughs> Ashley <laughs> so Ashley here, you can see that she didn't super stick to the guidelines that we said, and that's not a bad thing, okay? So you see the logo is in a different spot. One of the things that you typically want to highlight, um, you want to highlight your name and bold it or underline it if you are the presenter of this particular work. That's one thing we didn't cover, but everybody does it and so the great thing about her poster is that she has space right Mm -hmm. and it's it's clean it's neat it's very um compact and that's what people like to see they don't want to see something that's totally full and to the brim like the previous poster like there was hardly any there was no white space except for the stars and (laughs) that's kind of weird so when you do a poster think about that think about and it's like a puzzle when you do your poster right so depending on how you want to tell your story and the pictures and the figure legends that you're going to do this particular guide um going from abstract to background um to hypotheses and results in this kind of flow may not be applicable for you maybe you need to just go from left to right top to bottom so you just have to adjust that based off of what you're doing Mm -hmm. and so another thing that we kind of didn't talk about was in Ashley she has things broken up into pieces and that's okay if you don't have enough space so her background is towards the bottom on the left hand side but she also still has more background to tell you about Mm -hmm. and so she made it in the second column but she made sure to denote that this is a continuation of background so the person who's following along with her won't get lost okay and that's very important to um, establish as you're establishing um, continuity through your stories so even though you're explaining it to them sometimes people don't necessarily comprehend things best by listening to people sometimes it's best they best comprehend it by looking and reading and so when you do it this way to make sure they can follow the story they can follow the story so so i I guess we'll we'll do some last some of the last points and then we'll switch over. I'll make you host and you can show your prep poster. Okay, that that's fine. Sound good? Yeah. Um, so some last considerations. When once you finish your poster and you're looking at it, you're proofreading it. Um, does it make sense? Um, the way you have it structured, does it flow well? Um, did you you have a good balance of images versus words? We saw that one poster that was just all words and they had one little hamster in the corner. Um, you want to make sure there's plenty of graphics to help you kind of tell your story. Um, is it in the right format when we're submitting it? We're submitting it for printing. We want it to be in a PDF format. 
um, are the, the, the images pixelated, like Anisha said, you want to fix those because it'll make it, it's only going to be worse once it's printed on a larger poster. Um, does it all need to be there? You don't have to be super verbose about your methods. Talk about the methods that are most relevant to the work that's presented um, and, and go into detail on those, but you don't have to be nitty gritty. You don't need to describe what, you know, reagents you're using. They may ask you, and you'll need to know that information, um, but you don't have to have it written on the slide. It just takes up space that does, doesn't need to be taken up. Um, so yeah, and then we'll have questions and things later, but I'll switch over to you, Nynesha. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna make you a host, change host. Okay, I think I made you the host. I think so. Oh yeah, it says I'm in the host now. Okay, so I'll do a screen share. And this is just another example of what I think is a good poster. People thought it was a good poster, so I think it's a good poster. Um, so you, you see I was kind of very basic here, white background, black, um, black text. Mm -hmm. um, you see how large the, the title is. Um, I also want to give credit to the other people that also worked on this work. I'm presenting the posters, so my name is underlined and it's bolded so they know who is giving the talk, if they have any questions. Because um, often in conferences, people will read your abstract and they're like, oh, I forgot to ask this question. I can email her, but I don't know her name. But they can go in that abstract book um, or the conference book to see. So um, you kind of see it's in a, a similar layout to Ashley's, right? So I have, you know, the abstract here. I have the hypothesis clearly stated. And then I kind of did something that deviated from what we talked about earlier is that I didn't even put a method section. And so we said before that that's optional, but throughout the method section, I mean, sorry, throughout the results section, I kind of go into what we did and so this particular poster was presented at a Gordon conference and Gordon conferences are very small and intimate and typically people who are there do some a lot of the same work that you do and so um, we didn't talk about certain images but um, when you talk about immunofluorescence it's very important to have a contrast um, with your background and you want to have clear pixelation because in IF photos, it's terrible if you have pixelation. Um, the same thing with histology photos. Um, if they're very grainy, it looks terrible, y'all. Like, don't do it. And so um, also with mine, I, I typically don't like to use a lot of words when I'm doing a summary. So my summary was um, basically a picture. Right, it's a model of like, this is what I think is happening. This is what, if we inhibit um, this particular key pathway, this is what's gonna stop happening. And um, so sometimes people like that, it's really up to you what you wanna do with your poster. It's free range as long as it makes sense, okay? And that's basically what Matt was talking about on the last slide. Does it make sense? Is everything there? Can the audience follow it? And that's what you need to do. And also, sorry, I meant to say this. So also, um, for my last PI, she kind of turned me on to this um, where I put one, two, three, four for like figures so that people don't have to guess which way to go. They know that all of this is the result section, but this is figure one. This is figure, oh, this is figure two. This is figure three and um, people can easily follow. The easier you make it for the reader or the person that you're presenting to, the happier they'll feel. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So any questions? Are there any things that we need to address as far as the virtual expo, Gareth? I'm not sure, um, any adjustments we need to make or anything we need to address for the students to have? Uh, I did do a, a, in the chat, I put a link to a YouTube video uh, because in order to upload to Canvas, they will have to export their uh, PowerPoint okay. slide. And so I gave, we just have some quick instructions there. Okay. And then I don't know if either of you have, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here and I apologize for not preparing you, for, but uh, 
you know, some people will be doing animation with their uh, with their slide. Mm -hmm. uh, do either of you have experience with that? Uh, maybe some, if you have any like quick tips or tricks that might be helpful with that, so that when they for narration, you know, that's the other thing because people will have their poster slide and they'll have some narration with it while they'll be walking people through the poster. Uh, oh. So if you have any advice on that, that would be helpful. But if not, it's totally fine. I, I, I didn't ask you to do that in advance. No worries. Um, I, I have you any experience? I don't have any experience doing the. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of experience with animation, um, and voiceovers. I don't do it too often, um, but I guess it's really equivalent to oral presentations, which I yeah. actually like better than posters. Um, once again, introvert here. I like to do it <laughs> one time and like everyone. <laughs> one and done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, uh, yeah, it's great to meet all you guys, which it's great to meet people at poster sessions, but it's also cool to do orals. So I guess my advice for animations is don't have too many um, and don't do crazy animations. We don't want to see things spinning like news report, like, woo, you know, you have those spinner things. No, don't do that. Um, have it basic, appear, disappear. Um, you can use it animations if you want if you feel like you need to cover something up in a figure so let's say i don't know your figure has you have five different um sub figures within one figure and you want to walk your 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 person through it like a b c and you want to uncover each of the conclusions for each step mm -hmm. you can use just like a black i mean sorry a white box and you know, copy make a duplicate of that particular slide um, instead of using an animation, just depending on what you're comfortable with. If you if you are very comfortable with animation, cool. You can do it, make sure that it's going in the right order. Since you're doing this virtually, um, you always wanna preview it, make sure that it's actually doing what you're supposed to do. But if you're uncomfortable, go to the basics. Make sure you do the white box and then slowly unravel what you wanna unravel. So in terms of um, recording, recording is very important, um, especially, I'm not sure about this case. Do you have a time? Is it time? Yeah, 10 minutes or less, yeah. Okay. Five to 10 minutes, so, but the whole thing about being concise and precise is the same thing here, that you really wanna hit the highlights, you know, and, and, and make sure you're hitting all the important parts. Right. Yeah, it's exactly what um, Gareth was saying. You just want to be super concise. You want to be very clear. And it helps if you're narrating things, it helps to write out what you want. And so some people, some people, they want a script. And so it's okay at this time to do a script because people are not going to be seeing you. They're just going to be hearing your vo voiceover. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes people just like bullet points to say, okay, this is just a reminder. This is where I need to go. This is what I need to say. So once again, just kind of self-reflect how you want to do things. Make sure you practice because you only have a 10 minute time limit. Do not be the person that goes over 10 minutes. <laughs> that is terrible. People can't stand people who do that, okay? <laughs> so um, you don't want it to be too long. You don't want it to be too short, right? It shouldn't be like, okay, we wrapped it up in three minutes because yeah. you probably didn't explain everything that you were supposed to explain. But hit a medium and you should be, you should be fine. Excellent. Uh, Alexis, did you have any questions? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but since you're the student here, I thought I'd see if you had anything that to ask. Um, I have a couple. So my first one is for the methods section, how do you recommend going like creating some of those graphics? Um, well, so it depends on, on the method itself. Like if it's, say you are exposing mice and then you harvest different things from the mice, you could do more of like a flow chart. Um, that is, that's pretty helpful with the method. You, just kind of lead. Um, you can just do little blurbs within the boxes and then have arrows pointing to the next steps. If you want to kind of describe how method wise um, ste or step wise, how the methods go. I've, I've used flow charts a lot. Um, you can also, I mean, I showed you an example of some exposure system that I did. I drew it out. Um, everything I do, I do is so either I'm using a flow chart to help describe a method or I'm drawing it as best as I can. 
um, which is not sometimes is better than other times. Um, so you can, there, there are different ways to do it, but I do everything in PowerPoint. I don't try to go too crazy as far as drawing things for, for, uh, for graphics. So I'm going to share my screen about how I did my methods for like my, well, a recent shop talk. Um, and I can show you how I did mine. And then we can talk about, because I think you have something specific in mind. Um, so maybe we can parse out about what you're thinking and what methods you're talking about. So let's see. Okay, so this is a good example of how I did my methods. I didn't want to keep telling people that I infected mice with aerosols, so I I kind of mimic what was happening. So this is an aerosolized chamber. I'm putting the mice in. The mice are oh, I guess I should do that. So the mice are put in the chamber. These green things are TB, which represents um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then this shows that over 300 days they were infected at these different times. So um, let's see, that's one way. Um, this is an experiment. So we're saying that, you know, we're looking at two different types of mice. We let them be infected for 100 days. We gave them, we gave the mice, we pipetted certain, these specific cells into mice. We let them go for 20 more days and then we harvest. And then this is kind of the flow chart that Matthew was talking about. So when I was looking at, I'm um, trying to understand what neutrophils were doing. I said that first I isolated the neutrophils. I infected them at this MOI at this time. And then this is what I looked at. And this is what you're gonna see over the course of you know the next couple of slides. And these are the two different populations that I was looking at. Um, so does that help a little bit about the range of what you can do? Yeah, it's more of just um, like, do you create those right in PowerPoint? Hold on for a second. I can't see you, so I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, I'm stopping here. Okay. Uh, yes, some people who are really good and they have a lot of money, they do it in Photoshop and they can make these awesome, awesome um, graphics. But yeah, I mainly do it in PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have something in mind specifically that you were like thinking about? Um, <clears throat> mainly I just want to show like injecting mice with like CRISPR and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know like if you just put little mouse pictures right in PowerPoint and then try to like draw arrows and stuff like that. I just wasn't sure like how oh, most yeah. people go about that. Yeah, Alexis. <laughs> you know what? Make it as easy as possible. <laughs> Oh, go take that clip art mouse. <laughs> yeah, get the clip art mouse. <laughs> go take it. I've drawn a mouse. I've used shapes to draw a mouse, and I've, I've done that before. Um, but it's easy just to use the clip art mouse, and that's totally fine. Anything else? Um, I have another question too, kind of, I don't know if, I don't understand like exactly how, like am I supposed to do a voiceover for the UAB Expo? Um, how, if I do a voiceover, like how am I supposed to do a voiceover? Um, All right, so I'll answer that one. <laughs> okay. Although the others can chime in if they have expertise with it. So uh, we're, Alexis, just so you know, you have the full uh, range of different types of presentations you can do. Uh, you can just submit your poster. Uh, you can submit it in the form of slides if you want to separate what was on your poster and put it into slides like an oral presentation. You can do that. Uh, you can just do it with your, your poster as a PDF with you narrating it. But there is a way in PowerPoint, and we'll put up those instructions uh, of how you can add narration to a PowerPoint. Uh, it's fairly simple. But again, it's something where you want to kind of write it out and practice it in advance. Uh, but it's, it's just a so few quick clicks in PowerPoint. You can record yourself. And again, this is where if you want to create some animation, you can do that to kind of move through the poster using, you know, arrows or drawings or what have you. Um, you can do that. But that's not required, just so you know. 
uh, we'll have the full option for people because we know people have different technological levels and all those sorts of things technology available to them. So uh, we'll have some instructions on how to do that though when you do your submission. Okay. So yeah, those I'm just I'm online. overall just confused as to how I'm supposed to like set this up because I've already like played around a lot with a poster. I, I just I don't know exactly how to do the voiceover, but. <laughs> Um, can you pull up uh, your PowerPoint and show her the narration process real quick? Uh, yeah. Since you have the controls. If you could show that to her, that might make more sense. Uh, okay, hold on. Give me a second. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I have to do screen share. Um, Okay. Um, so you would have to, if you have the most updated one, um, so it actually shows you here, live caption and subtitles, but you would record the slideshow and recording the slideshow not only um, records you as you progress it, but it also, um, allows you to record it. Let's see if I can. So, um, so it's telling me that it wants access to the microphone. So I actually, when I talk, I'm going through the presentation as I talk. So that's how you record the narration. I would highly suggest that you practice, practice, practice before you do this. There'll be a timer in your left hand corner um, and it'll tell you at the end when you rehearse, like how much, how long you're staying on each slide. And if you're doing a 10 minute talk, depending on how you're breaking it up, that can kind of give you some leeway of like, oh, I'm going, I'm talking too long or I'm talking too short. This is where I need to, you know, change up the place. And the great thing about this is kind of in presenter view is that you can, um, you can do transitions. So it's already telling you what the next slide is. So after you do this slide, you can already be thinking, oh, this is the trans transition that I need to make in order to get here. But that's pretty much how you record and record both progressing through the slideshow as well as recording your voiceover. Was that okay? Yeah. Is there like any other options? Like if I were to keep it in a poster and not do like a PowerPoint type deal, or would you just recommend going off the poster and trying to do a PowerPoint? Um, do you want to do this one, Gareth? You're on mute. Sorry, my dog was barking. I muted myself. Uh, you, so you can do it either way, Alexis. So if you just have the one slide, which is your poster, you can talk someone through that, right? And have your pointer showing them and you're recording that and you can upload it just using your post. You don't have to do 15 slides. You just have the one slide and record from that. Um, that's definitely an option. That's probably one of the easiest ones that you can just kind of talk about your post from all the aspects on your poster. That's an option. Or, you know, as I said, break it down into those individual slides and do a kind of a longer recorded version like that where you have more options with transitions and things like that. Does that make okay. sense? Yes. Okay. And you can get as fancy as you want. I mean, you know, when you're recording it, you can do arrows and, you know, animations within even a single slide. You can just kind of draw things to highlight things. You can... I'll do it however you want, but whatever is best for you telling your story with that poster and that, that research is the best way to do it. So think about what you're presenting, which format will work best for that, the way that you think you can convey the information the best, and then go with that. The nice thing about having it kind of, and I'll just, again, this is a little bit more work, but if you already have it in a poster, then it's ready for another presentation, right? You can also then bring it up into the longer one, present it here at this expo, but then you have that poster ready for a future, uh, like a fall expo or something like that, if you want to present the same information, but in poster format. 
with live in-person interaction, <laughs> which we will get back to. <laughs> Although I will say we will have a virtual option from this point forward with our expo. Uh, we're really trying to see this as a silver lining, that this is a way that we can expand the expo with more and more students who maybe are, are remote students who can't get to campus to do a presentation. We're gonna give them this option from this point forward. So we'll be improving all of these things as well. So uh, appreciate your patience, Alexis, as we kind of work through some of the kinks on this. Any other questions right now? Uh, no, I'm all good for now. Okay, and you've got my email. Uh, so feel free to email me directly if you have any more questions on the way. We will have another workshop next week, which will go over kind of giving that other type of presentation uh, and also talking about, you know, talking and how you present yourself. So another option some people might have as well is that we'll actually have a video of themselves presenting the poster. That's another option if you already have, some people already have their poster. You know, I have a few that, you know, submitted an app in January, for example. So they are they present. They may just walk through their poster and, you know, physically view it in front of a video. So we'll have that next week, but we'll be updating the website as well with lots of informational uh, tutorials and things like that along the way. So, um, so thanks for joining us. And Matthew and then Shia, thank you so much. We really appreciate you rolling with the punches. And <laughs> no with it. it was fun. That was awesome. And, uh, and thanks, Abby, for uh, getting the set and recording it. So we'll put it on our, on our website so this will live on for other folks who weren't able to make it today. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Appreciate it, and uh, stay safe. Thanks, you too. Thank you, you too.